Hi, everyone. I'm Francesca. I'm Walker Carey's communications manager. I've spoken to many of you in the past. Um, I, I hope to meet all of you soon, hopefully during the performance season. Um, if you would like to go around in the chat and introduce yourselves, that would be great. Also tonight, if you have any questions, please just type them up in the chat and I'll ask them to Adam when we get to the end of each section. Um, and since we have just gone seven o'clock, um, we will begin tonight with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I acknowledge that I am recording this meeting from the land of the Darug people. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we meet today. And in the spirit of reconciliation, Waka Kiri acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Adam Loxley. Adam is our festival director and he was a founder of Waka Kiri 29 years ago. Take it away, Adam. Thanks, Francesca. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Wave if you can. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, look, welcome to our, um, uh, this is our second um, online masterclass that we've tried. Um, it's, uh, it's a new thing for us, but we think that it's working really well. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks for attending. Um, and also I just want to say thank you to everyone for participating this year. Um, we know that it's a difficult year for schools especially on the back of last year. And um, we're really grateful that um, we're, you're putting in the effort to get involved in Waikakiri this year. Um, so yeah, just want to say a, a special thank you there. Um, so what are we going to be covering today? Um, so we're going to go through the criteria in depth. Um, so you have a very good understanding of what we're, what a Waikakiri story dance is all about. We'll be looking at the um, secrets to success document as well. Um, We'll be talking about story construction and at the end of that we'll also do some hot tips on you know what the judges are looking for um, so as we do each section like francesca said um i'll pause and, and, and ask if anyone's got any questions and um you know if you, if you think of a question message it through um and and if you're really desperate to get it in you can shout it out and uh, and um, i'll answer it as well so um Okay, so look, we'll start by reviewing the criteria and just give me a second and I'll just um, get my PowerPoint presentation up. Oh. Francesca, can you, it said that the, you've disabled sharing. Sorry, I can't hear you now, you've muted yourself as well. <laughs> Classic. Um, Adam, give it a try again. Okay. There we go. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay, wonderful. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, first of all, we're going to start with the criteria. Um, so, uh, First of all, this is the criteria, <clears throat> the description of Wakakiri that you would have all seen. Um, it's uh, what you would have seen in a leaflet or on our website. Um, it is the classic, uh, you know, what is Wakakiri, um, i.e. it's a three to seven minute performance by a group of students that theatrically tells a story using a creative combination of dancing and acting. Um, so with that criteria, uh, that description goes a whole bunch of criteria that the judges see, um, that you should you should see as well. It's on our website, but and but it's, I think it's really important that we we can break that down. So uh, so that's what we're going to do. So um, let's let's do that. So first of all, <clears throat> schools can tell any story that they wish, um, and the story should be progressive, orientation, complication, resolution. Um, so okay, obviously uh, story is really important uh, for Wakakiri. Um, and I'm going to touch on story a lot tonight. Um, but uh, first of all, so you can tell any story and you can literally tell any story that you want. Um, and there, there's no restrictions there. Um, when it comes to story though, um, I, I like to ask schools to think about uh, what's, what the, is the message that you're trying to send? You know, what are you trying to say? Um, as opposed to what story are you trying to tell? Um, you know, so your, story, your message might be about bullying or it might be about mental health. Um, 
So I, I think, you know, actually thinking about what your message is is really important because it helps drive um, a lot of the motivation when, when it comes to creating your story. Um, when it comes to choosing that message, um, choosing a message that engages your school community um, and your principal um, is, is a really great way to place to start. And it's also a good way to get help. Um, so if your school has a theme or is there an issue that your school is trying to address, um, it might be worth contemplating that. Um, or is there a subject that your students are particularly interested in? Um, last year, we had a lot of schools do stories about um, climate change. And we also got a lot of stories about um, bushfires because obviously they were the big things that were on the school's minds. Um, but we, we do find that when schools do stories that their community and their class is engaged in, that they just get better results because you get better engagement with the kids and it really comes across in the end result. Um, uh, also, you might want to consider, is there a local issue or a history that you can explore? Um, so once again, those stories that, um, that come from the heart can be uh, really powerful. Um, reconciliation um, or environmental stories. We've had stories um, about uh, endangered, endangered birds that in a school community. Uh, we've, we've seen really amazing immigration stories. Um, and one of my favourite ones was the, uh, a school in uh, Bulay in New South Wales. They did a story about the Bulay um, uh, mine disaster. And um, a lot of the kids that were in that story, their grandparents were involved in the disaster. So there was this lovely sort of um, cross you know, intergenerational um, engagement there. And um, it, it did a lot for the school community. Um, and it was, yeah, led to some really amazing moments on stage. So, um, yeah, when it comes to your story, your story choice, I really recommend, you know, um, seeing if you can tap into something within your school. Um, the, <clears throat> uh, we also say, Wakakiri, we say, yeah, great stories inspire change. And, um, you, know, you know, that should be um, some part of your inspiration as well. Um, a really important part of that, uh, that description there, that criteria is that it should be easy to follow. Um, so and it, the way you construct your story is really important. Um, the story is what the audience see on stage. Uh, don't presume that people, so say you might be doing a, a retelling of a story like, um, I don't know, The Rainbow Fish or something like that, a classic book. Don't presume that um, everyone has seen or read that story and therefore they know what you're doing. Um, a classic story I can tell you is uh, we had a school, they did a retelling of, the, of Avatar one year and it was amazing production, um, but the, there was a lot of bits in it that they just did that they assumed that the audience knew what was going on. And the head judge turned to me and said, I've never seen this movie. I've got no idea what's going on. So, uh, yeah, let that be uh, yeah, just a, a word of warning there. Don't always assume that people know um, classic stories because they don't. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on. Oh, sorry. Um, does anyone have any questions about story? Okay, if you do want, like I say, um, just shoot them through to Francesca and she'll shout them out to me. Um, <clears throat> okay, next part of the criteria is uh, story dancing. So uh, story dancing is that creative combination of dancing, creative movement and acting to tell a story. Um, it's all about creativity and characterization. Um, so when we say that creative com combination, um, so uh, you can use, so that, that kind of means 50% dancing, 50% acting. And some schools literally do that. They, they just, they dance or they act. Um, but ideally what you're trying to do is blend the two and that's story dancing. But it doesn't really matter how you do it. The main thing you don't want to do is be too heavy in one direction or the other. Um, you know, so if it's just dance, um, that's not really what we're aiming for. And if it's just acting, the same thing. Um, get your, try and get that balance right. Um, Characterisation um, is also really important, um, especially when dancing. So um, we're, we're looking for uh, strong characters in your story. Um, so if you're on stage and you, you're in character, when you're dancing, you should be dancing in character as well. So, you know, my classic example is, you know, if you're on stage and you're a kangaroo and you're doing some sort of a dance, you should be dancing like a kangaroo. Um, 
So yeah, and that's something that the judges really like to see. Um, and just while we're talking about the judges, um, saying once we're not looking for, uh, when it comes to story dancing, we're not looking for technically correct dance. Um, what we're looking for is, is well rehearsed dance. Um, and it doesn't have to be technical. It just has to be well, you know, well executed. Um, and uh, I can guarantee you that we've seen lots of really fantastic stories um, told on stage with really simple, simple dancing, but done well. And sometimes when it's done well in big groups, it looks fantastic. So um, yeah, don't underestimate the power of a simple dance move. Okay, um, any, any questions on story dancing? Okay, good. Okay, soundtrack. Okay, uh, so the soundtrack uh, to your item should enhance the telling of the story, but not tell the story. And um, that's gonna be a bit of a repeated theme from here on in. Um, so don't rely on the soundtrack to tell the story. Um, I, I've, and uh, so I've, yeah, I've literally seen schools who tried to cram so many soundtracks in for each part of their story that it just became a big mess. Um, so when you're doing to your soundtrack, um, a big tip is less is more. Um, you know, choose songs that, that suit the mood of, of, your, of, the, of the part of the story that you're trying to tell, um, but don't try and you know, use the soundtrack to, to, to get your message across. Um, you can use um, narration and you can use voiceovers in your soundtrack. Um, they uh, can be really effective when they're used well. Uh, once again, don't use them to tell your story, but they, you can use them to set up the story and you can use them to, you know, highlight um, uh, you know, moments or even just, you know, progress the story um, in, a, in a big way if you have to. Um, don't overuse it though, but when, when, when used effectively, that can be really, um, really great. Um, also, when you're choosing your songs, I recommend... Uh, have a, have a really close listen to the lyrics and maybe even look them up. They're not lyrics. Um, sometimes you can be singing a song. You don't always realize what um, they, they, they're saying or what they might mean. Uh, it can be a little bit embarrassing um, if you get there on the day and someone points out that, you know, your song isn't um, PG. So just be aware of that. Um, and finally, um, uh, when it comes to APRA, um, and submitting your, um, your songs for APRA. Um, I know everyone gets very anxious about it, and, um, but we found that in the last two years, APRA, they've, they've rearranged their licensing. So um, pretty much every song um, gets uh, approved. The, the main thing, main reason why you're submitting your, your songs is so that those artists can get their royalties from the ticket sales that happen through Waikiri. So, um, yeah, so don't worry about having a song rejected, but do list them so that they get their royalties. If, you're, if you use a song that is an original song, maybe from a friend or something like that, um, just make sure that, you know, that that song, you've got permission to use that song. Um, it's always important. You don't, want to come, you don't want that to come back and bite you. Uh, okay, any, any, that's it for soundtrack. Any, any questions there? Oh. Adam, we do have a question um, from Marlisa. I, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, would the PG rating still apply if you were using an instrumental version of the song? So um, I think I, no, it wouldn't. No, so it's it's um, no, it, it doesn't apply. Um, so I guess you know you just I guess what all you need to think of is you know if someone's sitting in the audience and what are they going to hear? You know, will they be offended by that? Um, and yeah, we, that you should be fine there if it's just an instrumental. Um, okay. All right, so uh, the next bit of the criteria is sets and props. Um, so once again, <clears throat> uh, our sets, props, costumes uh, should be used to enhance the telling of the story, not tell the story. Um, they should be well utilized and not gratuitous. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, that you well utilized and not gratuitous, that, that part was brought into Waikakiri a long time ago, um, because we wanted schools to, uh, be, uh, not feel like they had to have big sets of props to tell a creative story. Um, we're looking for, 
you know, props and costumes that I will utilise, that they do enhance the telling of the story, but they're not just there to fit out the stage. We, we didn't want to put pressure on schools to, to feel like it had to become a big prop and costume fest. Um, uh, so, but yeah, so not, they're not there to tell the story. Um, I, sometimes I've seen schools, you know, hold up signs with saying, and then this happened. Um, I, I, don't, I don't recommend doing that at all. Often the audience can't read it. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, narration cards just don't really work on stage. Um, but a, a well-used prop or a costume can really create a magic moment on stage. Um, and so, yeah, uh, and so in saying that, yeah, we, 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 do, we do like to see props and costumes as part of Rocket Curry. It's a creative event, um, but uh, yeah, we just don't want to see schools break their budget trying to get them on stage. Um, minimizing your environmental footprint um, to create props and costumes for their performance. Um, so Waikikiri has been a champion of sustainability since it began. Um, and that's a big part of the way we try to encourage schools to be um, minimal, to minimize their props and costumes. Um, it doesn't mean that we want you to go out and make your props um, out of, you know, and the costumes out of plastic bags. Um, we are, we really do actually encourage schools to make new sets, um, but when they do it, we want them to make sure that that set can be reused in the future. The last thing we wanted to see is a set, you know, get made and then get chucked in the bin. Um, and if you're thinking about making new um, sets, you know, contact the office because we've got some really great designs or ideas that we can show you. Um, just simple things, uh, how you can make a, you know, a backdrop that can be reused each year, um, simply painted, um, you know, backdrops that can be, you know, rotated, all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, some of our, my, my hot tips about backdrops, especially, are, you know, if you're going to make them, make sure that they can fit into, you know, the back of a station wagon or, you know, like a standard trailer that maybe a parent could bring along to the show. Um, the last thing you want to do when it comes to props and costumes is hire a truck to get them to the show. So a little bit of thought when it comes to props and costumes can make a big difference as well in terms of cost. Um, but um, yeah, like I said, it's not about making stuff in plastic bags. Um, and also it can be fun, you know, when you're uh, making, you know, your props and painting them and stuff, uh, you know, getting the kids to think about, you know, where does the paint come from and, and, and what, and, you know, when they wash their brushes, you know, where does that water go um, is also a big part of what we do. Uh, any questions about sets of props and costumes? Okay, all right. Um, okay, each year we have the annual signature item. Um, so, and we encourage schools to creatively incorporate the signature item into their story. It's not compulsory, it's just something that's fun to do. Um, some schools really get into it and uh, it doesn't matter what their story is. Uh, occasion, you know, some schools can either, some schools actually like, do their whole story around the signature item. Others just incorporate it creatively. And sometimes uh, schools just bring it on, you know, as part of their speeches at the end. Uh, it's just a fun thing that we do with Wakakuri. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you uh, get, just don't, don't get too up, uptight about it, um, but it can be fun. Um, so there's, we've also have some extra criteria for secondary schools only. Um, secondary schools can use live singing um, to enhance their soundtrack. So uh, what that means is that they usually, as part of their soundtrack, they usually have like just a backing track. And then, uh, you know, we have microphones that the kids can use. They come out and they sing. And they sing. Um, so the, what I've got to say about live singing, if you are going to use it, um, make sure that um, your students can actually sing. When, when it's used effectively as part of a, an item, it can be fantastic. We've, had some, we've seen some amazing moments where kids come out and just create this lovely moment on stage. Um, but I've also seen a few performances die because um, you know, the, the, the student couldn't sing uh, the song in the, in the way that it needed to be sung. Um, and, it, and it did detract from the, the, from the performance. So yeah, just be aware of that. Um, 
also secondary schools um, and dance schools can use uh, projections on the rear screen. Um, so the thing with projections is that uh, once again, they should support the telling of the story, they shouldn't tell the story. Um, and the, the content that you use on the screen, it all has to be original. You, we, we've had schools in the past download, you know, um, bits of movies and put them up on, on the back screen and uh, that's a, a breach of copyright. So um, you need to create your own content um, and, and use that and you need to be careful that um, it's all PG as well. Uh, do we have any questions about that, Francesca? Adam, we have one question. It's a little bit of a different topic, but yeah. um, from RMDMS, we've actually got, uh, yeah, one question. So um, from RMDMS, RMDS, can the monkey be a stuffed monkey or should it be the exact one shown on your website? That's referring to uh, this year's signature item. Oh, okay, yeah, I, it can be any monkey that you want. Um, no, it can be, you know, we've uh, had people come out uh, you know, dressed, well, not as monkey, we haven't done monkey yet, but in the past, yeah, I've seen them, you know, I've seen the monkey be, you know, it could be part of the show, it could just be, you know, um, it, it could be, you know, someone, you know, acting like a monkey. Um, it could be part of the, the backdrop, you know, it could be anything. Yeah, absolutely anything. So yeah, it doesn't have to be the one, the picture. The picture is just something that we put on our uh, poster and stuff to, uh, yeah, just to, to symbolize what it is. So yeah, no, no go to town, be crazy. Um, have fun with it. The, the more, don't, don't be too obscure. Um, if you can create a nice moment, if you really want to try and highlight the, you know, the monkey, try and create a moment where the focus is absolutely on it. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, like I said, it's just about having fun. Adam, I've got one more question. Um, and this is from Catherine. And she says she was told that primary schools would be able to use projections this year because performances were going to be a mixture of secondary and primary. She's performing at uh, the Clock Tower Lounge in Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about why we do limit projections to secondary and dance schools, just because of the challenges we've had in the past. Um, yeah, look, we, the, so the, the idea when the secondary challenge was created, um, the, the, the idea of letting them use live singing and projections was to uh, encourage the schools to step up um, and uh, give them a, a greater challenge. Um, all the, the pro using projections also comes with a, for us, it comes with a lot of technical difficulties. Um, and we've been using them with dance, with secondaries and dance schools for the last few years now um, and not letting primaries use them because um, of the technical challenges of using them. As we, the, the more we do it with um, secondaries, I, I, I feel like it's something that we, we will let primary schools do in the future because I realise that the, we've realised that it, it can be a way for schools to save, um, you know, uh, resources on making sets and, and props, it does create a nice backdrop. Um, but at the moment, yeah, it's just for secondary and primary for that reason that we created it as an as a extra um, challenge for those schools so they can have a point of difference um, when schools go, you know, kids go from primary to secondary school, they, they, they want to, uh, we want them to just to feel like it's a step up for them and there's something that they can look forward to. So just jumping in and again, Adam just said um, that projections are for primary and secondary, but he meant to say dance and secondary. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, we've got another question we've got from Courtney. As a private dance school, our age group is predominantly secondary, but will include a few primary age students. Will we be able to utilize the projections and live singing? So I believe yes. this comes down to which challenge you're entered into. Yes, no, but the dance challenge, if they're in the dance challenge, then um, then definitely yes, live singing and projections. Great. Great. Okay, that's it from now. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, so the, the, we have a couple of guidelines that go with the criteria um, and these have been created over the years to help the judges um, make decisions. Um, the first one is our great story guideline. Um, so 
This guideline recognises that first and foremost, a great story is made in the telling. Um, so it's all about, you know, is it progressive? Um, does it have an orientation, complication, resolution? Is it easy to follow? Not the subject matter. Okay, so it's not about your, it's not about the story. It's about how you tell that story. Um, but if two stories are equally well told, then the the uh, subject matter um, does become relevant. So, uh, so the reason we, we've had in the past where you know we've had a uh, the judges have sat down and they've gone, okay, we've got these two schools, can't make a decision between the two of them. They're, they're, you know, they've both got really great story. They've told a really well you know, constructed story. Um, and we can't tell them apart, what do we do? Um, and then, well, then they go to that, well, how appropriate and relevant to the performers is their content? And um, so if you've got, you know, one school doing a story based on, you know, I don't know, um, Angry Birds, you know, the, the, the game, or another school doing a story about climate change, then the judges probably will then lean towards, you know, the climate change story. Um, so yeah, your story doesn't really, you can tell any story that you want and it doesn't matter until it matters. That's a pretty, and, and that, that happens, you know, not that often, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, the other guideline is our creative diversity guideline. And this guideline is all about um, allowing both blockbuster and minimalist uh, productions uh, to have an equal chance of winning titles um, in Waikakiri. Um, so yeah, it, it recognises that there are, you know, the two schools can be creatively equal and have tell great stories, but they can be different in style and scale and technique. Um, and what we found in the past is that, you know, same thing, the judges would look at an item and go, well, you know, look at all the effort that they've put in with those, like, you know, those amazing props and costumes. Um, part of the, we, of the philosophy of Akakiri is we really wanted to encourage creativity. So, um, so we now we, we tell the judges, you know, we, if you if you see that um, and you see that minimalist item, then we encourage you to put them to nominate them for a national title. So, um, yeah, it's our way of saying to everyone, you know, we if if you want to go blockbuster and do the big production, absolutely go for it. But to those minimalist schools, don't feel like you're you're being disadvantaged because the judges are aware of that. And this is part of the criteria. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, I'll assume that's a no. <laughs> okay. So next section um, I wanna talk about are the, our secrets to success guide. Um, now, every, you all should have received a copy of this. Um, it's part of the, the Wakakiri resources and we've got some great resources. Um, also, I just wanna mention, um, if you haven't joined our teachers Facebook forum, um, I encourage you to do so. Um, it's full of teachers that have been in Wakakiri before who love Wakakiri and they love sharing their knowledge. And um, yeah, if you, if you join that and you have any questions, you know, pop them on there and you'll get answers from head office, but you'll also get you know, lots of teachers giving you advice as well. It's also a great place to um, ask for costumes and, and sharing of props and stuff like that as well. So um, yeah, I encourage you to do that. But the, uh, the secrets to um, success um, is a document that, uh, yeah, we've, uh, well, the reason why we've created it. Um, the main aim is to help teachers avoid burnout. Um, and we want schools to be realistic about you know, what they can achieve with the resources that they have, save time and money. And we want schools to get a result that um, they can be proud of. Um, uh, so, yeah, like, like I said, it's, we, we want, we, so we've been doing work here for a long time. We've seen schools make, we've seen schools make common mistakes. Um, this document helps you avoid those common mistakes. It's based on what really successful schools do and that those schools come back year after year um, and that and when I say successful schools I don't mean the schools that, that that win I mean the schools that come back 
And the teacher rolls in and she's got a smile on her face and she's having a great time because, um, you know, she, she loves what she's, she, he or she loves what, she's, what they're doing. And, and you can just tell that they've enjoyed the experience. And, but then you, often we see new, often new schools come along and they're pulling their hair out because they've just, they've, they've tried to do too much and they've run out of time. They've jammed all these extra rehearsals in. Um, at the end and um, and they're just feeling really frustrated by the whole process so yeah well, what we're trying to do here is encourage schools to um, get the best start that they can um, so that they enjoy the process they can get a good result and build over the years so how does it work okay look it's, it's really it's actually quite simple um, and when you get the guide just look at it it's 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 all there but it's all really about um, doing an audit on what you already have um, and then making and using that audit uh, to help you make decisions moving forward so that, um, yeah, you don't make mistakes. So, so uh, like asking questions like what sets um, and props do you have in the wardrobe? Uh, you know, go and have a look, count them out, um, see what you've got. Uh, you know, I went to a school once and um, we, we went through their wardrobe. They had all these penguin costumes and we were like, maybe we should be doing a story about Antarctica, you know. Um, but they didn't even know they existed. You know, like often things get shoved at the back of the cupboard and get lost. Um, but, yeah, uh, also how many rehearsals do you have? Um, and be realistic about it. You know, get out the calendar, mark them down. Um, and then when you're planning your rehearsals, you know, how many scenes have you got? You need to really kind of, you know, plug all those rehearsals into those, um, into those dates and see, you know, exactly how many you've got. Um, who's going to help? Um, you know, who's going to help with costumes? Who's going to help with props? Um, you know, can they be relied upon? Um, do you need to form groups? Um, you know, get, you know, find out those, those commitments early rather than, you know, uh, deciding that you're, you need a whole bunch of costumes and then realizing that you know you don't have the help that you need and you have to do it all yourself that's a really you know a horrible situation to get yourself into um while i'm on costumes um you know a hot tip um you know if choosing your when you're in your choosing a story if you choose to do a schoolyard story um then you don't need costumes you know you can do school uniforms um if you do a story that's set in a you know just in a uh like a you know a city or somewhere like that. Same thing. If the kids can wear their, you know, their, their civvies, you don't need costumes. Um, decisions like that can make a big difference to your workload. Um, yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So, how many um, rehearsals do you have? Um, Who's going to help you have done that? Okay, yep. Um, and right through to, sorry, even to performance day when it comes to costumes, sets and props, hair and makeup, especially on the day. Um, who's going to help you come, who's going to come along on the day, you know, do that hair and makeup, you know. Um, so try and get those commitments early so that you can figure out, uh, before you've even chosen your story, try and get those commitments so then it can, it'll influence what kind of story you choose. Um, okay, so... The other part of the secrets to success is uh, constructing your story. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. The third part is, um, is just about scheduling. And um, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, plan everything down to the last detail before you get started so you don't get nasty surprises. Like I said, costume sets of props, hair, all those things. Um, because sometimes in the planning, it, it's when you realize that you, you have bitten off too much and maybe you need to go back to the drawing board and start again. And that isn't necessarily a bad result. If you realize that in your scheduling that you just can't do this, then that's a, that's a good result because then you'll go back and you know, throw things away and, and, and make it much easier to do and you'll get a good result. Um, so yeah, um, it's common to run out of time. <laughs> um, and you can always add more when you're, um, when you, if you, you know, if, you, if you're working on your performance and you get it done, then you can always add more. But, um, yeah, it's a really common mistake for uh, not just schools. I've, I've seen lots of theatre companies who are working on productions 
do the same thing, you know, just bite off more than they can chew and run out of time and add all these extra rehearsals. And um, yeah, you just don't want to do that. You, it's a fun, it should be a fun experience. Okay. Oh, do we have any questions? Sorry, just on that while I, I'm in, in between sections. Francesca? No, not at the moment. Anyone got any questions you want to send through to the chat? Okay. All right, good. Well, now don't be, don't be shy. All right, moving on to story construction. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, this section is designed to give, um, to help you deal with the classic priorities that a teacher is always trying to juggle. Um, so you want to give all your kids equal stage time. I know that that's a big priority for, for teachers. Um, you know, the pressure from the parents, um, yeah, they're paying to be in this, so you want to see them on stage. So how do you achieve that? Um, how do you keep your rehearsals um, limited, you know, to you know, big groups so that you can be efficient? Um, and, uh, and how can you be creative at the same time? Because I think for a lot of teachers, this is a creative process and you want to have fun with it. So, um, yeah, how can you be creative with this process? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest this. I'm going to show you this model. Um, it's, a, it's a classic model. It's been used um, so many times over the years. Um, and you can use it to build a really simple story dance or you can use it to build a very complicated story dance. Um, and... Look, I'm just gonna, I'll just show you an example of it and explain it to you. That's, I found this might be that hoping this is an easy way to do it. Okay, so this is a story. Um, so the, the message was, you know, never give up. That was the theme for the, for the story. Um, and the story goes like this. So boy wants to go to the dance. Um, he wants to dance in the playground but he's mates, with his mates, but he's a terrible dancer and he gets bullied. So he decides to go to dance classes. Um, first he goes to, to, and to a dance class and learns to do the twist. Then he goes and learns ballet. Uh, then he learns break dancing. He goes back to the playground and, and shows his mates, he blows them all away. And then everyone comes back on for a finale. So like this, you, this is a classic sort of simple story. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's fun, but the, the, it is, the, the key to it is, I'm going to just want to point this out. So the, the opening scene um, is your orientation and complication scene. Um, it can be done in lots of ways. It can be done with just a small group of kids on stage who come out and act all this out, um, or it could be done in a big group. But either way, what you've done, you set your story up and you show in the audience a complication. Um, and then the next three scenes, I call them journey scenes. Um, and that's where each scene shows the journey towards the, um, the, the resolution of the story. But the key to these three journey scenes is that they all involve large groups. So in rehearsals, you might say that you're, you know, you've got, you know, 60 kids and, you know, you've got a group from year four and from year five and year six. Well, you know, year four might be doing the twist, year five are doing the ballet, um, you know, year six are doing the break dancing. But those three groups can all rehearse separately um, and they all get a lot of time and that's where they get a lot of time on stage in those big journey scenes. Um, then for the resolution scene, the boy goes back to the playground and you know, blows them all away. So once again, that could be done just with a small group um, because it's a, you know, it's, that's your resolution. And then everyone gets involved in the finale. So that then you might bring all of your... Um, your three groups together um, to perform in the finale. So what you've achieved there is you know, you've got three large groups and then, so you've got four big dance numbers there. Um, so this is a pretty simple story um, and it's not that exciting, <laughs> but it can be exciting. Um, and the way that you can make it a little bit more exciting is by adding um, uh, these joining scenes. Um, so, if you add a joining scene, so it kind of looks like this. Um, so this is the same story. Um, so the boy goes to the dance, wants to dance on the playground with his mates. It's terrible. Um, 
So he goes to dance classes, he goes and does the twist. Um, so, but after he's done the twist, then he goes back and shows his friends what he's learnt and they're not impressed. So he goes, right, I have to go and learn something else. So he goes off and he learns ballet, um, comes back, shows his friends they're not impressed. So look, it's exactly the same story, but we've just added in two little joining scenes. Once again, those joining scenes could be done with um, like a small group of kids. Um, they, they, they're there just to, that enhances the, the um, progression of the story. Um, also joining scenes are a good opportunity to, uh, you know, to do set changes um, or even you know, costume changes backstage. Um, but they just add little, a little bit more to the story. So when I was saying before that this could be a, a very simple story or a very complicated story, you could keep adding those joining scenes um, or, or moving these large scenes around to make your story more complicated. But if you're starting for the first time, this is a real, this is a, like I said, this is a classic model and it's a great way to achieve all your goals. Um, so, and the idea is you, you know, you come up with your, with your message for your story and then you write the story into this model um, as opposed to, you know, coming up with a story and then trying to get all your needs and jam them into that story. I'll show you another example using exactly the same model. Um, so the, the, this, in this example, the, the message is take care of bushland. Um, so it's exactly the same thing. Uh, and this is another classic story that we see in Wakakiri a lot. Um, uh, so a, a group of kids go to the bush or a picnic, but forget to put out their fire. Um, and that, that's your orientation complication. So you set up the whole thing. Um, so first we see you know, a, a peaceful bushland with animals. Um, then we see the fire move in, take hold. Then we see firefighters put out the fire. Um, and then we, the children, you know, return after the fire and to replant. Um, so I've, I've seen lots of variations on this thing. Um, once again, you know, you've got those three journey scenes in the middle for large groups and you've got your sort of finale at the end. Um, so once again, if you add sort of joining scenes to it, um, so after the first scene, we see the peaceful um, bushland animals. Um, and then uh, when, the, when the fire moves in, um, you know, we see that the, the animals panic and run away. Um, and so once again, you know, it's just a, it's a small scene that takes place you know, um, in front of the larger scene. It, it just cr creates a, a better story um, and, and makes it more interesting. So, Using this classic model, um, you can do a lot. And how can you make it, you know, better again? Um, so, so my advice with this is, you know, start simple and grow, um, get it right, and then you know you can always add those joining scenes later. Um, but also um, the finale. So putting a finale at the end, it's a great way to get everyone involved. But it can, it it, it sometimes it always doesn't fit. A finale doesn't always work at the end of the story. Um, so, but the finale could become another journey scene. So you could have an, you know, um, and you know, it does. All the finale doesn't even have to be in the at the end of the um, of the story. It could you could put the finale right in the middle of the story where you have every single kid on stage, you know, and, and do it there. So that leaves you your end the end of your story to be you know, maybe a bit more dramatic or something like that. But what I'm saying, I guess, is move those scenes around. Um, you know, play with that format, but um, keep those common ideas. Um, yeah, like I said, joining scenes create a more progressive storyline. And um, yeah, ideally, you know, when people get really good at this, then they're, you know, that those, the journey scenes are progressive as well. They're not just big dances, but they're, you know, they're dances that have, that, that move the story along. Um, Okay, so that, that's all I've got to say about the um, the secrets of success in constructing a story. Um, Francesca, have we got any questions on that? We do, do. Yeah. We have another question from Marlisa. Um, all these examples had a finale in them. Could a story still be just as successful without a finale? Yes, and absolutely. Um, and and look, I would say possibly you're more successful without a finale. Um, you know, the, the reason why I showed you that classic model um, is just because 
it it is a you know for teachers who are trying to give their kids stage time um the finale does kind of tick a lot of boxes for them um but yeah it, it the, like i said before the, the finale can often detract from a good story um and um so yeah like you, you can yeah so you don't have to do it like i said yeah make it another journey scene um or or, or find a, a creative way to to put the finale in you know you could even open your story with a big dance number um but yeah that's like i said this is just a classic model you don't have you can tell your story in any way that you want that you want um i'm just suggesting this this model um as a good foundation model for, for, for schools that are doing market theory for the first time um and it works well with that idea of doing an audit um, and working out, you know, what you want to do, looking at this model, using this model. It's a, just a great way to sort of to launch your, your Wakakiri career, <laughs> give you a good foundation to, to grow over the years. Because um, we want to see schools come back. Um, and, um, you know, using this classic model, you will get a really great story. You will have a product that you'll be really happy with. Um, but yeah, you can, but you can do whatever you want. Shall we move on? Yep, good to move on. Okay. Um, okay, so what are the judges looking for? So I showed you the, so what I showed you at the very beginning, the criteria, um, so that was the, you know, the description of what the what a story dance is. So our the judges get this quite these uh, they've got a judging guideline that they use, um, and this is what they're given. So it's based on what we just went through. It's just a condensed version. Um, and some notes on this. Um, so okay. So first of all, you will see um, story is worth twenty five points, and story dance is worth twenty five points. So obviously. Um, you know, those two are you know, very important elements of a story dance. You know, I've emphasised that quite a bit. Um, you know, that, uh, that progressiveness um, and being easy to follow and appropriate. Um, you'll also note that performance, you know, how rehearsed, how well rehearsed was the performance um, is, is quite important. Um, and well, for obvious reasons, um, you know, a well rehearsed performance looks better. Um, and then finally, all of those additional elements, all those things that enhance the telling of the story. Um, oh, and it actually says, uh, yeah, all, did all those additional elements or lack of, because, you know, like I said, we, we also encourage creative minimalist stories. Um, yeah, how did they enhance the, the telling of the story? Um, so they're worth 20 marks. Um, you won't get to see these marks because the judges um, use them however they want. Some judges mark hard, some judges, you know, give lots of points. And so giving the marks to um, schools at the end, it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't reflect your result. So, but if you want a guide for what the judges are using, this is what they're using. But um, when judges, when they're watching story dancers on stage, often, you know, it's, it's if you're ticking all the boxes, what, what they're sort of really looking for is that they, they want to be entertained. Um, and um, so just so that you know, so every judge that we get is different. Um, they're all, all our judges are, um, they're all from the entertainment industry. They've, they've all had careers They've all been very successful actors, dancers, um, and directors. Um, so they're all really well qualified, but they're all different. Uh, they all have their own opinions. Some of them, you know, like more musical theater type, you know, performances and others like the, you know, the, the serious dance. So we, we try and rotate our judges um, at least every three years from one location so that, you know, we, we always get that variety in results. Um, but, um, but I guess the common theme from judges is it's, um, it's not so much the story, it's the way that you tell it. That's always, you know, the big thing. And we know that judges love a good story. 
Um, so what can turn the judges off? Well, bad story construction. Um, so if a story's hard to follow, um, so you need to remember as an audience member, we're often lazy when it comes to following a storyline. You, 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 you want to be able to just watch the performance and you, sh you should just be guided through the storyline naturally. You shouldn't have to work at it. Um, and on that, so I'm just going to say, a, a really hot tip here is when you're rehearsing your performance, towards the end or maybe halfway through your performance, when you've, when you've actually you know, put the whole thing together and you're still working on it, um, invite someone who has no idea about your performance to come and watch it um, and get them to watch it without um, costumes or anything. If they, at the end of it, if they can't understand what happened in your story, then you need to go, you need to work on, the, on, on your direction and your focus. Someone should be able to tell what's going on in your story just without costumes or signs or narration. They should just get a sense of, you know, of, of, of the actual story. And it's a really great test for how well you've done. And if they, if they can't understand it, then, yeah, you need to work on it a little bit more. Um, also, judges don't like um, uh, stories that don't make sense, um, like a lazy storyline um, that doesn't really add up. That can be really annoying, um, you know. Um, so, you know, when something, you know, for some reason, you know, there's a big gap in the story, um, that, that it's the kind of thing that just gets up their nose, I've really noticed. Uh, they, um, also, uh, this is yeah, bad direction and focal points is, um, is also something that, that I don't like. Um, as an example, I, I saw a school um, do a, a performance. It was an amazing performance. Um, it was technically brilliant, just really spectacular, great costumes and, um, and so much going on on stage. Um, and there was so much going on on stage actually that it was kind of hard to figure out what was going on. You, your eye was drawn to so many different parts of the stage that some, and often because the essential parts of the story were happening on stage left, but um, your eye was drawn to the rest of the stage and you were missing really essential parts of the story. And all of the judges just said, you know, that was fantastic, but I've got no idea um, what, what that story was about. But just on the pure spectacle, it, it, it did well, but it just fell over because you couldn't follow the story. And that was really came down to that idea of, you know, it was just that your focus, you need to make sure that you have a focal point where the audience's eye is drawn to that story all the time. Um, they also don't like, <laughs> and uh, we've touched on this, a finale that spoils the mood. Um, so if the finale really doesn't, if it jars with the rest of the performance, um, then they kind of, sometimes they can really spoil a good performance, especially if something just really dramatic has happened and, you know, dead people get up and start dancing. Um, then they're like, oh, you know what, it was great right up until that point. And then they just sort of, you know, they wasted the last couple of minutes just having a big dance. So, yeah, um, whoever brought that question up before, yeah, it, you know, make sure that your finale does, you know, make sense or is relevant um, and, um, you know, and you don't have to have one. Um, also, uh, I think we touched on it before, that presumed knowledge of a story. Um, yes, make, you know, not everyone's seen Avatar, so don't just presume that people know. Um, and also, um, they don't like flippant resolutions um, where, you know, that, that once again, it's that, that lazy storyline that, you know, that you haven't really, you know, made a statement. Um, it's just everyone just got together and celebrated um, is, is, isn't always the great way to end a story. Um, what do the judges like? Um, so uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's really hard to say what makes a story really special. Sometimes um, they just work. Um, uh, like I said before, I think though, sometimes when stories come from, uh, from the heart, from, from a school community, they always shine. Um, and especially if there's a, an interesting backstory, um, 
we've had schools who, you know, told stories about um, Hurricane Katrina. I remember a school in Queensland did it years ago, and it, it was it was started by a student who um, just decided to do some fundraising at school to support these communities, and um, and the. The school, every, all the other kids got involved and they started doing, then they decided to do their story dance about it. And um, it was just a, it was just a wonderful process. Um, so, yeah, the, the, but it, it, I don't know why, but when schools do that, it really does come across, that sincerity comes across really strongly. Um, what do they like? Obviously, they, did, they like stories that are easy to follow. Um, and, um, and then I think if, if you nail, if you really have a story that is easy to follow, then, then it becomes more about um, capturing their attention with something um, special in your story. You know, um, you know, a, a, a clever moment, a dramatic moment. Um, you know, a, a, an interesting theatrical moment. Um, I, you know, I've seen really interesting um, uh, ways of, you know, where schools have, uh, but in their in their story, somebody went from being a child to being an adult, um, and they, you know, they. In, in the story, the kid walked um, behind a screen and then an adult walked out immediately after and the, just the, the transition was seamless and it was really clever the way they did it. Um, so, just, so special moments like that can just uh, make your performance, um, uh, make an impression in the judge's mind about your performance. Um, a clever way um, of also another example is uh, I saw a school create a beautiful way. Of, uh, they, they they were doing a um, recreation of um, of Cook sailing across the oceans. But the way that they created the the boat on stage was just all with kids um, and a sail in the middle. And the the kids sort of created the boat around them, and they marched the whole thing across stage. It was a, a just a, a wonderful piece of creativity um, and collaboration with the kids. Um, it was just one of those special moments on stage. Once again, those special moments stand out. Um, um, also, uh, I think I said this before, a, a well-rehearsed item makes a massive difference. Um, and, you know, a, a, a well-rehearsed simple dance um, can really catch the eye. I saw a performance once where they were literally doing the box step for, um, for about a minute. And they, were, it, but they had the whole stage full of kids all doing the box step. Um, and there was the they were depicting soldiers marching back from battle, but it was so powerful um, and um, but so simple. Um, they were marching to um, "You're the Voice" <laughs> by John Farnham, but it was just a really clip, um, amazing moment. Um, also, another uh, new takes on classic stories can be fun. Um, you know, uh, putting uh, you know taking a a classic story like Cinderella or you know. Um, yeah, you know, and but putting a modern story into it, like a you know a schoolyard story, doing something like you know sort of twisting it, um, is 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 clever, um, and that always impresses judges. Whether where you've you know just something something clever in your story can be really um, impressive. Um, a twist in the ending as well always works. Um, and finally, um, uh, set some props that add something special. Um, uh, you might have seen that picture of the um, of the dragon before. Um, that was a, a, an amazing moment on stage. It was just really just a, a dragon's head, and all of each they, they they had a bunch of kids behind it, and each kid was a, a, a part of the spine. But it, it looked amazing. Um, and yeah, those uh, you know I've seen uh, so many dragons and dreaming creatures and robots over the years operated by kids. Um, it's they're always special. And, um, and, you know, those big costumes as well, those big sets, they, they can also be something for your, um, those kids that don't want to perform but want to be part of the backstage crew. Um, you know, using, if you've got a, you know, sometimes you might end up with 10 kids that, you know, they want to be part of it but they just don't want to be on stage. But if you can come up with a really special costume for them to operate, um, then, yeah, it can be really special. Um, okay. So that's um, that's it for my uh, presentation on what are the judges looking for. Uh, do we have any any questions? I'm I'm quite happy to take um, any questions you have now. If anyone wants to just open up their mic and uh, speak out with a question, that would be fantastic.
or you guys are all just Waka Kiri <laughs> pros. You're on top of it. We love it. Okay. Well, look, if, 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 if you are all happy, then, um, yeah, well, then that's the, that's the end of the presentation. Um, uh, yeah, look, thank you very much. Um, I'd, yeah, I'd love to get some feedback from you. I think Francesca's got an evaluation that we'll probably send later on. But um, if you have any questions, you know, feel, please feel free to um, email them or call the office and we're always willing to help. Uh, Adam, I just have a question. Yeah. Uh, from Michelle, we're at Carlisle Primary School. Mm -hmm. we, we are going probably to submit our um, like iMovie. I'm just curious about um, parts of the sets we can use. Do we have to stay in one particular area of the school or can we change areas? Oh, you can change areas, yes. Yes, you okay, can. Okay, great. Yes. So we don't need to be specific to a gymnasium or an undercover area. We can use different parts of the school? That's right, yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, we um, originally, we that's how it was last year, but we... Uh, we, we blended them so that you can use different parts of the, you know, of yeah, different locations to create, um, uh, yeah, different backdrops. Okay, great. This is our first time, so we just wanted to be sure we were on on board with that. Yeah, it's it's check out the website um, under uh, um, video Akikiri, and it's all all the um, all all the guidelines are there as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, Michelle. Anyone else? Okay, thank you so much, guys. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, as I said, I hope I have the chance to speak with you all soon. Yeah, yeah thank you. Everyone have a great night. Um, I will be sending out a recording tomorrow of this. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Still there, Francesca? I am still here. <clears throat> yes. And that was was that that was bang on an hour. That was good. Yeah, that was great. That was perfectly timed. <laughs> cool. All um, right. I'll, yeah. um, are you happy to end, end the meeting? I'll talk to you tomorrow. Sounds good. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye, Adam. Thanks. Bye.